You're going to learn some things in here about alcoholism. You're also going to learn about the fact that this is not an individual program. And you're going to help understand and come to the fact that we need a power greater than ourselves to recover. We of Alcoholics Anonymous, who are the we of Alcoholics Anonymous that they're speaking about? The first 100. We always have to keep that in mind. That is not the membership of AA today. This is the we of Alcoholics Anonymous, the original members who wrote the book. No thousands of men and women who were once just as hopeless as Bill, nearly all have what? Recovered. It doesn't say nearly all are recovering. How did we ever get that word recovering into the program of AA? I asked a sponsor of mine who was here years ago. He came in in 1941. He said, Bill, he said, some of the guys in here went out and slipped and they came back in and they said that the reason they slipped is because they thought they were recovered and they could drink again. And he said, so now they start saying, well, I never can drink again, so now I'm recovering. But with that, a lot of people start hearing recovering at meetings and they start thinking in terms of recovering as if you're never recovered. If you remain recovering, you're probably going to have white knuckle sobriety. You're always going to be fighting booze or whatever it is you're in here for. If you've recovered, you're going to have the spiritual experience that's going to release you from the desire to drink alcohol. That's what you want. And we're going to cover that, and it's described in the, after step 10, and you'll see how clear that becomes then. Nearly all have recovered. They have solved the drink problem. Not all their other problems. The drink problem has been solved. We are average Americans. All sections of this country and many of its occupations are represented as well as many political, economic, social, and religious backgrounds. We are people who normally would not mix. But there exists amongst us a fellowship, a friendliness, and an understanding which is indescribably wonderful. We are like passengers on a great liner the moment after rescue from shipwreck when camaraderie, joyousness, and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. What is steerage in a ship? That's down in the very bottom. The captain's table is where the elite sat. And it's saying as a result of this boat uh, fiasco that they were in, and they were rescued, camaraderie prevails. There's no class distinctions there. It's like recovery from alcoholism when it gets bad enough we recover from alcoholism. We have camaraderie and fellowship here. All right. Unlike the feelings of the ship's passengers, however, our joy in escape from disaster does not subside as we go our individual ways. Why? They're not having a boat wreck every day. They're not having a sinking every day. But we're dealing with alcoholics every day. The feeling of having shared in a common peril is one element in the powerful cement which binds us. But that in itself would never have held us together as we are now joined. The tremendous fact, and underline this paragraph, the tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. It does not say an individual solution. Let's stick with the black print. We have discovered a common solution. That means we can all use this. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. An illness of this sort, and if we have come to believe it an illness, involves those about us in a way no other human sickness can. Now you notice it doesn't say disease in here. Because it was so radical at the time for these people to start coming out with alcoholism as a disease rather than a moral issue, a lack of willpower, they didn't want to be too heavy. So instead of saying disease, they said illness to start getting the point across. The whole major thrust of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has been to get the population to accept this illness, all right? as a little bit more than a matter of willpower. If a person has cancer, all are sorry for him and no one is angry or hurt. But not so with the alcoholic illness. For with it there goes the annihilation of all things worthwhile in life. 
It engulfs all whose lives touch the sufferers. It brings misunderstanding, fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends and employers, warped lives of blameless children, sad wives and parents, anyone can increase the list. This paragraph probably uh, leads more to the misunderstanding or the clearance of misunderstanding by a lot of the spouses of alcoholics or family members. You know, there's an organization out there that deals with children. Uh, we know what organization that is, and they deal with these issues of the behavior of the alcoholic. I'm separated from my first wife, I don't know how many years, but to this day, I still yet believe that she does not think that my behavior was as a result of my alcoholism. She still believes that everything that occurred in our lives, I did intentionally. I'm a mean, egotistical son of a gun or something. Do you know why? We have not done a very good job of selling the population in our country that this is an illness. You see, my alcoholism determines my behavior. My behavior does not determine my alcoholism. My alcoholism will determine my behavior. I have to understand this. And each time a person stands up here and tells a group of alcoholics his or her character defects made him or her an alcoholic, we defeat this. Now we're saying it's a matter of intention. We're drinking to relieve a condition. If you are drinking to relieve a condition, that is choice. See? If you're drinking because you're shy, and if you drink, you're not shy anymore, then you're drinking by choice. But when you have alcoholism, you'll be drinking when you don't want to. Am I getting that point across? This is an illness. This illness will determine my behavior. We hope this volume will inform and comfort those who are or may be affected. There are many. Highly competent psychiatrists have dealt with us who have dealt with has found it sometimes impossible to persuade an alcoholic to discuss the situation without reserve. Strangely enough, parents, wives, parents, and intimate friends usually find us even more unapproachable than do the psychiatrist and the doctor. Again, this is very important, Bill shaking over it, right? But the ex-problem drinker who has found what? This solution. This solution is singular. It does not say these solutions. It's not plural. This solution, but the ex-problem drinker who has found this solution, the one the founders are speaking about, who is properly armed with facts about who? Himself, not about you, can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. One alcoholic to another. What happened when Bill Wilson went over to see Dr. Bob in Akron, Ohio? Dr. Bob was in the Oxford movement about two years. Bill Wilson was only in six months. In six months, Bill Wilson staying sober. In two years, Dr. Bob's getting drunk. What is, the, what is Bill Wilson doing that Dr. Bob is not? Bill Wilson is helping other alcoholics and telling everybody what's wrong with them. Dr. Bob's hiding it. He's keeping it to himself. He's not sharing it. Okay? And what happened when Bill Wilson, who is, uh, has nothing to do with medicine, goes over and sees uh, Dr. Bob? He gives him this solution, the doctor's opinion. And Dr. Bob says to Bill Wilson, a non-medical man, you are the first man who has ever understood me. You are the first man who has ever understood me. Why? Everybody else is telling him, use your will, doc. Use your willpower, doc. Why? They didn't have a problem with alcohol. You know how they state that in AA, don't you? In regards to alcoholism, compare it to a man who drinks a pint of castor oil, and then when it starts working, use your willpower. <laughs> See if you can prevent it. You can't. That's exactly with us in booze, all right? That the man who is making the approaches had the same difficulty that he obviously knows what he is talking about and his whole department shouts at the new prospect that he's a man with a real answer. 
that he has no attitude of holier than thou, nothing whatever except the sincere desire to be helpful, that there are no fees to pay, no axes to grind, no people to please, no lectures to be endured except mine. These are the conditions we have found most effective. After such an approach, many take up their beds and walk again. None of us, none of us makes a sole vocation of this work. What work? Twelve-step work. Not working with alcoholics, because you get a little confused there. There are some people in AA who say, I don't believe a person that's a, an alcoholic should be a two-hatter. So what do you mean? Well, if you come in AA, we don't believe you should be a counselor. I said, oh because I run a few treatment programs. And I said, well, you also told me that if you're not an alcoholic, you can't, you can't work with another alcoholic because you didn't understand it. He says, that's right. I said, you've eliminated the field. Nobody can work in it. That's how ridiculous some statements become in AA. Listen to what he said. I don't believe AA should be counselors. And if you're not an alcoholic, then you can't be a counselor because you don't understand these. There's no field. You have to break down a lot of what's said in here. None of us makes a sole vocation of this work, nor do we think its effectiveness would be increased if we did. We feel that elimination of our drinking is what? A beginning. It's not the ending. Not drinking is not the ending, it's the beginning. A much more important demonstration of our principles lies before us in our respective homes, occupations, and affairs. All of us spend much of our spare time in a sort of effort which you are going to describe. A few are fortunate enough to be so situated that they give nearly all of their time to the work. If we keep on the way we are going, there is little doubt that much good will result, but the surface of the problem would hardly be scratched. Those of us who live in large cities are overcome by the reflection that close by, hundreds are dropping into oblivion every day. Many could recover if they had the opportunity we have enjoyed. How then shall we present that which has so freely been given us? There's a question. What they're saying is we're only scratching the surface. We know there's hundreds of thousands of alcoholics out there who are not getting any service. They're not getting the message we have to deliver and they're asking a question. How can we help them recover? There is no AA at this time. You understand that when his book started being written in 1937, there was 40 alcoholics sober. When his book is printed in 1939, there's only 100 alcoholics sober. Akron, Cleveland, and New York. So there's 100 people. How are they going to get the message across? There's no meetings like this. Here's the answer. They're saying if we want to get this message across, here's the answer. We have concluded to publish a, an anonymous volume setting forth the problem as we see it. We shall bring to task our com uh, combined experience and knowledge. This is, is, uh, suggests a useful re program for anyone concerned with a drinking problem. In other words, they publish the book. The Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous expanded and grew, not by alcoholics going door to door and saying, do you have a drinking problem? It expanded through the publication of this book. The man in California with a drinking problem couldn't call up Akron and say, Dr. Bob, come and see me. I have an alcohol problem. But the people who read this book and followed its instructions were able to recover by the directions in here and start sharing it with others and the fellowship grew. The first sponsor that went national, right here. You know what the only difference is between then and now? That's all they had. So they accepted it. You didn't have somebody standing over your back saying to you, you don't have to read the big book. You don't have to do those steps. You don't have to do this. Just do what I did. There's the big difference. Now, one of the things Bill Wilson wrote about when he uh, was writing about the big book, he states in here why they wrote the big book. And he says, the number of alcoholics in the world who wanted to get well, we reckoned, was in millions. How could the great chance we had be brought to them? 
At the snail's pace we had been going, it was clear that most of them could never be reached. We could therefore no longer be a seldom heard of secret society. Word of mouth communication with the few alcoholics we could contact by our then current methods would not be only slow but dangerous. Because the recovery message in which we now had such high confidence might soon be garbled, you know what he's saying? People passing it on by word of mouth, the message is getting garbled and twisted beyond recognition. Clearly our budding society and its message would have to be publicized in a book. And Lois wrote in her statement, and I don't know where that book went, it was Lois Remembers, here it is. Why they wrote the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought I had it marked off here. But she writes in here, uh, page 107 and 108, I'd like to read this to you. Exactly what she says. That's what a lot of people in AA don't know. It's always good to read uh, conference approved literature. He and Bob assessed the current status of the movement. They were surprised to find that although many of those they had worked with had fallen by the way, 40 members enjoyed an average of two years solid sobriety. This was flabbergasting, awe-inspiring. 40 people impressed them. They really had hit on a program for helping alcoholics. Now they saw it could develop into something tremendous if it was not diluted are garbled by word of mouth as one person passed it on to another. Suppose a book was published to explain the program and give stories of how individuals attain sobriety. Wouldn't that offer many more alcoholics an opportunity to follow suit? And wouldn't it save the program from distortion? Both Bob and Bill and their 40 courts could never hope to reach the number of prospects that a book could. In the history, they're telling you why the book was written. And I will tell you what has happened today. I write a story and I give it to him to read. After he reads the story, I take it back from him and I tell him to tell the story to the next man and the next man and the next man. It goes all the way around this room and it finishes up over here with John. And then I tell John, now you write down the story as you heard it. And John writes down the story as he heard it. I read the original story that I gave to him and I read the one that was passed verbally through this room, and they know we compare. That's what's happened to the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. The program of AA has been rewritten verbally in the communication from one to another. And I must state at this time, unintentionally, a lot of treatment centers did this. They did not know what the message of Alcoholics Anonymous was, and they went psychology oriented. And as a result, we lost a lot of the message of AA. And I told you, those two guys who go around the country, Joe and Charlie, they've done a lot. Big book discussions, big book uh, meetings. I think the pendulum is swinging back toward AA. Spirituality is coming back to AA heavier than it ever has. And much to the dismay of many people, it's probably because a lot of people are coming in with drug issues and they find out that spirituality is really necessary for them to recover. Fellowship doesn't work for them. A lot of AAs don't like to hear that. But it's the truth. Uh, where was I? Oh, of necessity, there will have to be discussion of matters medical, psychiatric, social, and religious. We are aware that these matters are from their very nature controversial. Nothing would please us so much as to write a book which would contain no basis for contention or argument. We shall do our utmost to achieve that ideal. Most of us sense that real tolerance of other people's shortcomings and viewpoints and the respect for their opinions or attitudes which make us more useful to others. Those are qualities we try to develop. Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. What does our very lives of ex, as ex-problem drinkers depend upon? Our constant thought of others. Get out of self. That's what they're talking about. Get out of self. The person who comes to AA and says, I'm sick 
fix me, I'm sick, fix me, stays sick. The person who comes here and says, I have a solution to help others and goes out and helps others, forgets their own problems and gets well. That's a capsulated form of it. That's exactly what happens. Forget self. You may have already asked yourself why it is that all of us became so very ill from drinking. Doubtless you are curious to discover how and why in the face of expert opinion to the contrary, we have what? Recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. If you are an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, what do I have to do? If you're asking the question, what do I have to do to recover? Here's the answer to the question. It is the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically. It means right on target. We shall tell you what we have done. Before going into a detailed discussion, it would be well to summarize some points as we see them. Now, if any of these statements have been made to you, you're probably in the right place. How many times have people said to us, I can take it or leave it alone? Why can't he? Why don't you drink like a gentleman or quit? That fellow can't handle his liquor, why don't you try beer and wine? Lay off the hard stuff. His willpower must be weak. He could stop if he wanted to. She's such a sweet girl, I should think he'd stop for her sake. The doctor told him if he ever drank again, it would kill him, but there he is, all lit up again. Now these are commonplace observations on drinking, which we hear all the time. Underline this. Back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. What are we talking about? We're talking about what happens in this chart. People are not aware of the physical part of our illness nor the mental obsession. They can't be because they don't have it. My brothers and my family have made those statements to me repeatedly, time and time again. Now I resent the fact that I had to come to AA and somebody sit down and tell me I could quit drinking if I wanted to. All I had to do was be honest about my alcoholism. I came to AA and that's what I was told. Take the first step, be honest about it, and you won't drink no more. I did that repeatedly throughout my life and I could not stay sober. Now we're going to describe three types of drinkers here and this is going to get some clarification for you for the fellowship as to why some people can stay sober without a program. This is going to clear it up for you. Moderate drinkers have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely. If they have good reason for it, they can take it or leave it alone. They're on this side here. They're right there. Those are the people that have no trouble metabolizing alcohol. None whatsoever. My family's loaded with those type of people. They used to look at me like I was a freak. You know. The second type of drinker. This is probably a percentage of the population today. These are, are what we consider a hard drinker. Let's look at his description. Then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He may have the habit badly enough gradually to impair him physically and mentally. It may cause him to die a few years before his time. If it's sufficiently strong reason, ill health, falling in love, change of environment, or the warning of a doctor becomes operative, this man can also stop or moderate, although he may have it difficult and troublesome and may even need medical attention. That guy's gonna be just like an alcoholic. I met one Saturday walking his dog. He came into the program with me in 1961. And I said to him, my Steve, you haven't been to meetings for how many years? He said, Bill, I didn't need the meetings. I just got off the sauce, got away from my buddies, and that's all I needed. You see, he was with a drinking crowd. He broke away from the crowd, abstained from alcohol, and he was all right. I could never do that. We're going to describe that individual, the guy who comes in here because he's afraid he's going to lose his wife or get fired or lose a job. He can do that if he's a hard drinker. But let's look at this next guy. But what about the real alcoholic? You ever hear a guy stand up and say when he leads now, 
my name is Bill uh, so-and-so, I'm a real alcoholic. You know why he's saying that? He's telling you that the description of a real alcoholic fits him. He's a man who has to go through the recovery process, or woman. <laughs> uh, we have to go through the recovery process. We have to treat our alcoholism or we're going to relapse. But what about the real alcoholic? He may start off as a moderate drinker. Remember, we cover that. Progression. He may start off as a moderate drinker. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption when? Once he starts to drink. Doesn't say he has to drink every day. Alcoholism is not daily drinking. It's what happens to me after I start. What happens to me after I take the first drink. We talked about allergies this morning. and We talked about an allergy to strawberries. What happens to a person who has allergy to strawberries? They get a rash in hives. So the guy doesn't know what it comes from. He puts an allergy patch on his arm. Doctor takes it off. He says, hey, Joe, you're allergic to strawberries. You can't eat them. And the guy says, well, doc, I only eat strawberries once a year. What does the doctor say? Well, then you can't be allergic to them. You have to eat strawberries every day to be allergic to them. He says, don't eat the strawberries. You don't have to ration hives, right? When you have the allergy to alcohol, don't take the first drink. and You'll never set off the phenomenon of craving or allergic reaction. The whole basis of AA, don't take the first drink. Here's the fellow who's been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. He does absurd, incredible, tragic things while drinking. He's a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He is seldom mildly intoxicated. He is always more or less insanely drunk. His disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature, but little. If you guys don't know what they're talking about over there, just go over and talk to Tony. He can explain it all to you. He may be one of the finest fellows in the world, yet you let him drink for a day and he frequently becomes disgustingly and even dangerously antisocial. He has a positive genius for getting tight at exactly the wrong moment, particularly when some important decision must be made or engagement kept. He is often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor, but in that respect he is incredibly what? Dishonest and selfish. Remember they're talking to you about getting honest with yourself? They're speaking in regards to alcohol, especially. Because when it comes to alcohol, we become dis uh, incredibly dishonest and selfish. We don't even like to share after a while. You know, there's a period of time I passed, passed a brown bag around. After that, I didn't pass it. I had to keep it to myself, drink from somebody else's and get mine alone. He often possesses special abilities, skills, and aptitudes and has a promising career ahead of him. He uses his gifts to build up a bright outlook for his family and himself and then pulls the structure down on his head by a senseless series of sprees. All right, you know what's happening here? The guy who comes into AA, sobers up for a week, was going to lose his wife or the wife was going to lose her husband, stays clean, starts becoming everything they expect, takes on two jobs, gets a lot of money, and the family said, boy, we got it whooped now. And all of a sudden, choo, comes home, he's drunk again. He builds up the, the faith and the trust of the family and slaps him across the face again by a sense of uh, sprees. He is the fellow who goes to bed so intoxicated he had to sleep the clock around. Yet early next morning, he searches madly for the bottle he misplaced the night before. If he can't afford it, he may have liquor concealed all over his house to be certain no one gets his entire supply away from him to throw down a waste pipe. As matters grow worse, he begins to use a combination of high-powered sedative and liquor to quiet his nerves so he can go to work. Then comes a day when he simply cannot make it and gets drunk all over again. He's going to the advanced stages of alcoholism. Perhaps he goes to a doctor who gives him morphine or some sedative with which to taper off. Then he begins to appear at hospitals and sanitariums. This is by no means a comprehensive picture of true alcoholics as our behavior patterns vary, but this description should identify him roughly. They're giving him morphine. Think you can become addicted to morphine? You sure can. 
Second World War proved that. A lot of people who in the, in the Second World War and, and the First World War who had pain and wounds, they gave them morphine. You know what they found out? A percentage of the people taking morphine were becoming addicted to it. Not all of them, but a percentage of them. So they went to their laboratories and they developed a sister drug to morphine that was going to solve the morphine addiction problem. And the sister drug, they named it heroin, the heroine, the sister drug to morphine. We're going to wipe out morphine addiction. Now we're going to give them heroin. They found out people became addicted to heroin, so they came to the laboratories, and they came out with another one, and they took all the heroin addicts down to 55th Street in Cleveland to the clinic, and they gave them what? Methadone. Now, I, got, well, I don't know what they're going to come up with next. That's why Alcoholics Anonymous says, can't use any alcohol whatsoever, beer, wine, whiskey, cough syrup, if it's it, or mind-altering chemicals. It's the same. This is by no means a comprehensive picture of the true alcoholic as our behavior patterns vary, but this description should identify him roughly. Now here's the questions. Why does he behave like this? This is a question. If hundreds of experiences have shown him that one drink means another debacle with all its attendant suffering and humiliation, why is it he takes one drink? That's what my family was asking me, exactly what's in this book. Why, why, why? Why can't he stay on the water wagon? Why not the water wagon? The going on a wagon is the next vehicle to the next drunk. What has become of the common sense and willpower he still sometimes display with respect to other matters? Those are all questions. Here comes the answer to the questions. Perhaps there never will be a full answer to these questions. Opinions vary considerably as to why the alcoholic reacts differently from normal people. We are not sure why once a certain point is reached, little can be done for him. We cannot answer the riddle. They don't even get involved in a whys. All AA says, if it's happening to you, forget the whys, let's get into the treatment. You know, alcoholism is probably the only disease in the world where when you go for treatment, they spend more time in telling you how they got the disease than they spend in the recovery process. You ever think of that? You go into a hospital for a heart attack, you don't want them to spend six weeks telling you how you got a heart attack. How, what do you want to do? How do I get it fixed? How do I get well? You go to treatment for alcoholism, you want to spend six weeks telling you how you became an alcoholic. What do I have to do not to be alcoholic? That's recovery. That's what we all have in common. See, an overeater, a drug addict, a CA, an NA, an OA, an FA, and a GA, and whatever other kind of AA there is, the directions are the same for the steps. The problem is not the solution. The program is. You can talk problem from now to doomsday and never get well. We know that while the alcoholic keeps away from drink as he may do for months or years, he reacts much like other men. We are equally positive that once he takes any alcohol, whatever, in, into his system, something happens both in the bodily and mental sense which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. The experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. These observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink, thereby setting the terrible cycle in motion. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. If you ask him why he started on that last bender, the chances are he will offer you any one of a hundred alibis. Sometimes these excuses have a certain plausibility, but none of them really make sense in the light of the havoc an alcoholic's drinking bout creates. They sound like the philosophy of the man who having a headache beats himself on the head with a hammer so he can't feel the ache. If you draw this fallacious reasoning to the attention of an alcoholic, you will laugh it off or become irritated and refuse to talk. Once in a while, he may tell the truth, and the truth, strange to say, is usually he has no more idea why he took the first drink than you have. I'll confirm that. With all of the uh, problems and issues I had to deal with, which would occur if I took a drink again, I could not tell you why I took another drink when I knew what the results would be as part of our insanity. 
Some drinkers have excuses with which they are satisfied part of the time, but in their hearts, they really do not know why they do it. Once this melody, and that's not a song, that means illness. Once this melody has a real hold, they are a baffled lot. There is the obsession, the obsession that somehow, someday they will beat the game, but they often suspect they are down for the count. What is an obsession of the mind? It's an, a thought that has no opposing point of view. An obsession has no opposing point of view. An obsession is in your head and that's it. Can sway it. How true this is, few realize. In a vague way, their families and friends sense that these drinkers are abnormal, but everybody hopefully awaits the day when the sufferer will rouse himself from his lethargy and assert his power of will. The tragic truth that if the man be a real alcoholic, the happy day may not arrive. He has lost the power of control. At a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, this is very important, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. This tragic situation has already arrived in practically every case long before it is suspected. We have lost the power of choice. We're not drinking now for reasons that we think we're drinking. Here's something that a lot of people thought was new when they went to treatment centers, euphoric recall. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago we are without defense against the first drink. In other words, what they're saying is we cannot remember pain. You know, they said if the human brain could retain pain, a woman would never get pregnant over once. All right? We cannot retain pain. What happens to us when it comes to alcohol and using alcoholic is euphoria, euphoric recall. Just like what happened to Bill Wilson. He thinks of the good times. We can't remember the pain. That's why we repeat the behavior. Myself, and uh, this is a little bit of self-disclosure, I, I called my uncle to come and get me out of a jail on a DWI. And when he came and took me out, he was with the neighbor man, and we were walking down the steps of the jailhouse. And uh, he said to me, he, sa he said, well, Bill, uh, you're out. I said, yes, let's go across the street and have a beer. And he stopped dead in his tracks. He looked at me and said, my God, don't you understand what got you in there? There it comes. I'll call right back on my mind again. I have to think about it. I'm not choosing it. It comes automatically. Euphoria. It's where I was talking about the aspirins. See? Think of something, something terrible in your life. Something that really was uh, traumatic and it affected you. And 10 years later, you can talk about it and laugh. Think about the really painful things that happened to you as a child when you were in school and now you laugh at them. You've outgrown them, right? See, the pain, we can't remember that. That's what happens to us with alcohol. You know, I think it was one of them guys on the tape said, our national anthem, I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. The almost certain consequences that following taking even a glass of beer do not crowd into mind to deter us. These thoughts occur, they are hazy and readily supplanted with the old threadbare idea that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. There is a complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot stove. The alcoholic may say to himself in the most casual way, it won't burn me this time, so here's how. And after the third or fourth pounded on a bar and said to ourselves, for God's sake, how did I ever get started again? Only to have that thought supplanted by we'll stop with the sixth drink or what's the use anyhow, I can relate to that. Sitting in a bar room asking myself, just like this, how did I ever get started again? How did this happen? Now this only occurs to people who are trying to quit. People who are enjoying their lifestyle and they like what's happening in their life, AA is not going to make sense. If there's still fun and games in what you're doing, this is a mystery to you. All right? 
When this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, he probably placed himself beyond human aid. It's telling you again, power greater than ourselves. And unless locked up, may die or go permanently insane. These stark and ugly facts have been confirmed by legions of alcoholics throughout history. But for the grace of God, there would have been thousands more convincing demonstrations so many want to stop but cannot. There is a solution. If this is happening in your life and you really believe you want to change it, there is a solution. Almost none of us like the self-searching, what's that? Inventory. The leveling of our pride. The confession of shortcomings which the process requires for a successful consummation. But we saw that it really worked in others and we had to come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. When therefore we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools that are laid at our feet. There is no such thing as AA tools. There's no such thing as the tools of AA. They have always referred to as a skit of, kit of spiritual tools. And you notice you have to pick up the tools and use them. I got a toolbox at home. Those tools have never walked to a job and took care of the job themselves. I had to pick up and use the tools. That's exactly an AA. You don't come in here and sit in a chair and the tools will work for you sitting there. You have to start using the tools. The kit of spiritual tools. We have found much of heaven and we have been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. Remember we covered that in Bill's story? Fourth dimension of existence, spiritual experience or awakening. The great fact is just this and nothing less, that we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, toward our fellows, and toward God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. There is a solution that deals with a power greater than yourself. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we could never do by ourselves. I go through the steps to allow God to do for me what I can't do for myself. If you, that's talking to you, if you are as seriously alcoholic, we believe there is no middle of the road solution. And when a lot of guys come up to me and they say, Bill, I never read the big book, I never did the steps, I never did any of this, I said, yes. The big book speaks to fellows like you. They say it does. I said, yes. It says you're not as seriously alcoholic as the founders were. It says if you're as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there is no middle of the road solution. In other words, you can't walk just in fellowship. If you're a real alcoholic, you need the program. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible and if we have passed into the region from which there is no return through human aid, we had but one of two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could, and the other to accept spiritual help. In other words, here's alcohol, my power greater than myself, here's God. Which am I going to take? This tried this we did because we honestly wanted to and were willing to make the effort. Now this page 26 and 27 are the foundations of recovery in AA. It's going to tell us who gave us the idea for Alcoholics Anonymous and how it was achieved. You're going to find out that the idea for AA did not come from Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob. It came from a psychiatrist. And these pages are going to tell you how and why. Now the man that they're talking about here, the certain American businessman, is Roland Hazard, a millionaire in the 30s. A very wealthy man who never went to an AA meeting and died in 1948 sober, but he was part of the Oxford movement. He's the one who carried the message to Ebby Thatcher, and Ebby brought it to Bill Wilson. Let's read this. A certain American businessman had ability, good sense, and high character. He was a lot like me. <laughs> For years he had floundered from one sanitarium to another. What are they telling you? Anything that was not a hospital in those days was considered a sanitarium or an asylum. So this little unit that we're going through right now, if anybody says, where were you for four days? Say you were down to the uh, Jesuit retreat house asylum. 
It's not a hospital. And that's what they refer to sanitarium. He floundered from one sanitarium to another. You know what they're telling you here? He went from one treatment center to another. This guy's got money. He's going for treatment for alcoholism. He consulted the best known American psychiatrist. In other words, they're telling you psychiatry was here before AA. Then he had gone to Europe. You know this guy had money. The only way he can go to Europe at the time was by boat. There were no airplane trips. By boat, that was a trip. You had to have money. He's in the midst of the depression. He went to Europe, placing himself in the care of a celebrated physician, the psychiatrist, Dr. Carl Jung, who prescribed for him. Though experience had made him skeptical, he finished his treatment with unusual confidence. His physical and mental condition were unusually good. Underline this. Above all, above all, he believed he had acquired such a profound knowledge of the inner workings of his mind and its hidden springs that relapse was unthinkable. Nevertheless, he was drunk in a short time, more baffling still he could give himself no satisfactory explanation for his fall. What did that tell you? He learned the inner workings of his mind so well he believed relapse unthinkable. That's exactly what treatment centers are trying to tell you today. You have to learn what made you an alcoholic, you have to know what's going to relapse symptoms are and all this other stuff. And when you learn to know yourself, you're not going to drink anymore. From the very beginning, this is what was tried in rehab. It was unsuccessful. He's drunk again. Now you know this guy's got more money now. He goes back to Europe. So he returns to the doctor whom he admired and asks him point blank why he could not recover. He wished above all things to regain self-control. He seemed quite rational, well-balanced with respect to other problems. Yet he had no control over alcohol. Why was this? He begged the doctor, the world's most renowned psychiatrist, anything that's done in psychotherapy today, psychoanalysis, is done through the efforts of Carl Jung. They call him the Jungian theories. He broke away from Sigmund Freud, who believed everything was the subconscious and sex. Carl Jung set up his scone school of thought, which is used today. This guy's getting it right from the horse's mouth. He begged the doctor to tell him the whole truth, and he got it. And here's what the world's most renowned psychiatrist thought of alcoholics at that time. In the doctor's judgment, he was utterly hopeless. Psychiatry wasn't going to work for him. He could never regain his position in society, and he would have to place himself under lock and key or hire a bodyguard if he expected to live long. That was a great physician's opinion. But this man still lives and is a free man. He does not need a bodyguard, nor is he confined. He can go anywhere on this earth where other free men may go without disaster, provided he remains willing to maintain a certain simple attitude. Some of our alcoholic readers may think they can do without spiritual help. Let us tell you the rest of the conversation our friend had with his doctor. The doctor said you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. What's chronic? It keeps reoccurring. If your relapses and your drinking bouts and your drug addiction bouts keep reoccurring, that's chronic. You need something to help you. You can't do it yourself. I have never seen one single case recover where the state of mind existed to the extent that it does in you. Remember? The mental obsession, the state of mind, a psychic change is necessary. The psychic change is brought about by what? A spiritual experience or awakening. Our friend felt as though the gates of hell had closed on him with a clang and he says to the doctor, is there no exception? In other words, Roland Hazard is saying to Carl Jung, you mean I'm doomed to die? There's nothing left for me to do here. I can't recover. And in one paragraph, Carl Jung states what's necessary for the alcoholics of the future to recover. This is probably the most potent paragraph in the whole book of AA. And here's what he says. Yes, replied the doctor. There is. Exceptions to cases such as yours have been occurring since early times. In other words, even before AA, some alcoholics have been recovering. Here and there, once in a while, alcoholics, alcoholics have what are called what? Vital spiritual experiences. That's how they recover. 
To me, these occurrences are phenomena. The doctor says, I don't understand them. They appear to be in the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements. Ideas, what's that? That's your thinking. Emotions, what are those? Your feelings. And attitudes, your actions. In other words, your thinking, your feelings, and your actions, which were once the guiding forces of the lives of these men, are suddenly cast to one side. And a completely new set of conceptions and motives begins to dominate them. How? Through attending AA meetings? No. Through a vital spiritual experience. In fact, I've been trying to produce some such emotional rearrangements within you. With many individuals, the methods which I employed are successful, but I have never been successful with an alcoholic of your description. What kind of description was he? Chronic. The psychiatrist is saying chronic alcoholics, it does not seem to work with psychiatry, and we cannot get treatment centers to accept that fact today. We can't get them. They want to treat us mentally. They want to make it a secondary diagnosis. It's not so. Everything, any seminar I go to always tells me that mental health has been highly unsuccessful in working with alcoholics, yet we keep spending the money with psychiatric programs. 5% of the population of alcoholics need more than AA. Upon hearing this, our friend was somewhat relieved and he reflected that after all, he was a good church member. This hope, however, was destroyed by the doctors telling him that while his religious convictions were very good, in his case did not spell the necessary vital spiritual experience. Here was a terrible dilemma in which our friend found himself when he had the extraordinary experience which, as we have already told you, made him a free man. We, in our turn, sought the same escape with all the desperation of drowning men. What seemed at first a flimsy reed has proved to be the loving and powerful hand of God. A new life has been given us if you prefer a design for living that really, really works. The distinguished American psychologist William James in his book, Varieties of Religious Experience, indicates a multitude of ways in which men have discovered God. We have no desire to convince anyone that there is only one way by which faith can be acquired. If what we have learned and felt and seen means anything at all, it means that all of us, whatever our race, creed, or color, are the children of a living creator with whom we may form a relationship upon simple and understandable terms as soon as we are willing and honest enough to try. Those having religious affiliations will find there nothing disturbing to their beliefs or ceremonies. There's no friction among us over any such matters. And I want to tell you something. If a man has enough guts to stand up behind a podium and tell somebody that a rock is his higher power or a coffee cup is his higher power, he should have no shame in standing up before a group of people and saying that Christ was his higher power or Muhammad or Buddha to have a real God and to be ashamed to speak of it when somebody can speak of a rock or a table or something's wrong. Your higher power is your higher power and you're entitled to tell people what it is. But one thing AA, if you want to do a disservice to it, don't you ever stand up and say AA is my religion. You do a disservice to the founders of AA when you say that. AA was never meant to be a religion. Don't conf confuse that. We think it no concern of ours what religious bodies our members identify themselves with as individuals. It should be an entirely personal affair with each one decides for himself in the light of past associations of his present choice. Remember the individual Lydia, of the program at times? Telling you that again. That's the individual part of this program. Not all of us join religious bodies, but most of us favor such relationships. I told my sponsor the church is full of hypocrites because he wanted me to go back. I said, church is full of hypocrites. He said, room for one more, why don't you go? <laughs> you know, I know all organized religion is after is your money. He said, I'm quite sure they haven't given you, you haven't given them any of yours, Bill. I never did. I was always complaining about organized religion after my money and I never gave them any. The people given never complained. In the following chapter, there appears an explanation of alcoholism as we understood it, understand it. 
Then a chapter addressed to the agnostic. Many who once were in this class are now among our members. Surprisingly enough, we find such convictions no great obstacle for a spiritual experience. <coughs> Further on, clear-cut directions, not suggestions. Further on, clear-cut directions are given showing how we recovered. These are followed by 43 personal experiences. Now in these personal experiences, listen to what they demonstrate. Each individual in the personal descri stories describes in his own language and from his own point of view the way he established his relationship with God. Not the way he got sober, the way he established his relationship with God. These give a fair cross-section of our membership and a clear-cut idea of what actually happened in our lives. We hope no one will consider these self-revealing accounts in bad taste. Our hope is that many alcoholic men and women desperately in need will need these pages, will see these pages, and we believe that it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems that we will be persuaded to say, yes, I am one of them too. I must have this thing. Now, we're going to take a break here for about 15 or 20 minutes. We're going to come back in and do more about alcoholism. The chapter more about alcoholism is a group of uh, stories describing how people have tried to quit drinking. They're going to demonstrate how it was necessary to find a solution through God. All right? And what we want to understand here is these first four chapters again are dealing with only steps one and two. When you get into steps three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, you're going to be amazed at how simple the process is going to be. You're going to be amazed at it. You're going to find out a lot of what you're hearing in AA is misinformation. <coughs> Most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. Why did they use the word real alcoholics? Because that means that we have to go through the whole process now. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow someday he will control his, enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. See, we're not normal, we're abnormal. The persistence of this illusion, that's this idea, is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. What's the first step in recovery? That we're real alcoholics. There's no way we can do it without the program. The delusion that we are like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. That's acceptance of the second step. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. We needed a power greater than ourselves. We can't do it alone. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. We know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. You know what they're saying in there? Once an alcoholic always an alcoholic. All of us felt at times we were regaining control, but such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by still less control, which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. Over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. You know, it says, uh, intervals usually brief we can control our drinking. Some alcoholics will come to AA and they'll listen to this concept about the first drink and they'll say well a first drink I, I've gone out and taken a first drink I've gone out several times and not gotten drunk I'm not an alcoholic I've been able to control it sometimes and that may be true because it depends on what stage of alcoholism you're in. If you're in the early stages you may be able to do that you may be able to go out 15 times and drink, but the 16th time what happens? As the progression goes on, you find out now instead of going out 15 times before you get drunk and lose control, you only go out 10 times. 
and then it becomes five times. And then as the disease uh, uh, broadens, you find out now maybe every time you're going out you take a drink. But not all alcoholics are on the same level of alcoholism at the same time. That's what makes it confusing. It's a progressive illness. Some guys, I, I know in, in one case in particular, a friend of mine who since passed away, he went to a meeting and he kept hearing about this, if you take the first drink, you'll get drunk. So he stayed sober for one year, this magical year everybody talks about, and he gave his first lead. And after his first lead, he walked out of the meeting hall, went across to a place called the D&L Tavern. He had one shot and one beer and he went home. And he didn't drink anymore. And he laid in bed and he thought to himself, these guys don't know what they're talking about. They said, I can't do this. <coughs> Next week, he went to that meeting, his home group meeting, stayed for the meeting, walked out the back door, went to the D&L Tavern, had a shot and a beer and went home. Ah, these guys really don't know what they're talking about now. And he did that three or four times. After the fourth time, he went to the Slovak club, went inside and he'd come out for two days. See, you're able to do it short periods of time, all right? But the consistency isn't there. You can't do it consistently. Somewhere along the line, you lose track of it. You have to be aware of that. There are some people who are not in the advanced stages of alcoholism yet. We are like men who have lost their legs, they never grow new ones, neither does there appear to be any kind of treatment which will make alcoholics of our kind like other men. We have tried every imaginable remedy. In some instances there has been brief recovery, followed always by a still worse relapse. Physicians who are familiar with alcoholism agree there is no such thing as making a normal drinker out of an alcoholic. Science may one day accomplish this, but it hasn't done so yet. How many of you were around when they were talking about this uh, uh, plant that came out? You, you eat this plant and it was supposed to get rid of the alcohol in your system and you were going to get drunk? Now let's listen to the insanity of this. We drink because we like the effect, right? We don't drink because of the taste. If I drank alcohol and I didn't get an effect from it, do you think I would drink it? The last six men I have put in Stella Maris detox unit started drinking who were sober for a while on non-alcoholic beer. They started drinking non-alcoholic beer. Six guys I put in there so far. All right. Now, a guy who says, I'm drinking almost beer, makes about as much sense as a guy who says, I'm going to see a dealer and I'm going to buy some almost cocaine. <laughs> Why would a guy want almost cocaine? It, it, See, if you, if you go to the extreme, as you can see the nonsense in it. I don't buy beers like I told you, lemonade. I don't drink 24 bottles of lemonade. Why would I want to drink 24 glasses of almost beer? I get no effect from it. I would quench my thirst and quit. But these guys, psychologically, they don't get that effect. And they think, well, this may be settle my nervous condition or whatever the thing's happening to them. What happens to them? They have to go to the booze. It doesn't work. A higher power is still the best remedy. Despite all that men can say, many who are real alcoholics are not going to believe they are in that class. By every form of self-deception and experimentation, they will try to prove to themselves exceptions to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. If anyone who is showing inability to control his drinking can do the right about face and drink like a gentleman, our hats are off to him. Heaven knows we have tried hard enough and long enough to drink like other people. <clears throat> Here are some of the methods we have tried. Drinking beer only. Did any of you try that? Well, this chapter's pertaining to you then. You're in the right place. Limiting the number of drinks. I'm only going to drink six. All right. Never drinking alone. Never drinking in the morning, drinking only at home, never having it in the house, never drinking during business hours, drinking only at parties, switching from scotch to brandy, drinking only natural wines, agreeing to resign if ever drunk on a job, taking a trip, not taking a trip, swearing off forever with and without a solemn oath. I did that. Taking more physical exercise, reading inspirational books, 
going to health farms and sanitariums, accepting voluntary commitment to asylums as treatment centers. We could increase the list ad infinitum. That means we can keep going on with these things. Now, here comes the test. Here comes Alcoholics Anonymous by the founder's suggestion to people who don't believe they're alcoholic. We do not like to pronounce any individual alcoholic, but you can quickly diagnose yourself. Step over to the nearest bar room and try some controlled drinking. Try to drink and stop abruptly. Try it more than once. It will not take long for you to decide if you are honest with yourself about it. It may be worth a bad case of jitters if you get a full knowledge of your condition. How do you find out if you're alcoholic? You take the test. There's not a person sitting in this room that I have any doubts about that has to take the test. I think you failed the test long enough. You've got to try the recovery now. See, if you have ever tried to quit drinking and lost control when you started again, you're in the right place. I kept trying to define alcoholism. I kept saying to my sponsor, every day I had a different definition for alcoholism. Finally got tired of it. He said, Bill, do you want to know what alcoholism is? I said, yes. He said, go home and look in the mirror. <laughs> You'll see one. Though there's no way of proving it, we believe that early in our drinking careers, most of us could have stopped drinking. But the difficulty is that few alcoholics have enough desire to stop while there is yet time. We have heard of a few instances where people who show definite signs of alcoholism were able to stop for a long period of time because of an overpowering desire to do so. Here is one. Now they're going to give a demonstration, a classic example of a man who had an overpowering desire to stop drinking. We're going to look at his case history and see what happened to him, and then we're going to explain that to you and bring some other examples out beside. A man of 30 was doing a great deal of spree drinking. He was very nervous in the morning after these bouts and quieted himself with more liquor. He was ambitious to succeed in business, but saw that he could get nowhere if he drank at all. Once he started, he had no control whatever. He made up his mind that until he had been successful in business and had retired, he would not touch another drop. An exceptional man, he remained bone dry for 25 years and retired at the age of 55 after a successful and happy business career. Then he fell victim to a belief which practically every alcoholic has, that his long period of sobriety and self-discipline had qualified him to drink as other men. Out came his carpet slippers and a bottle. In two months he was in a hospital, puzzled and humiliated. He tried to regulate his drinking for a while, making several trips to the hospital meantime. Then gathering all his forces, he attempted to stop altogether and found he could not. Every means of solving the drink problem, which money could buy, was at his disposal. Every attempt failed. Though a robust man at retirement, he went to pieces quickly and was dead within four years. This case contains a powerful lesson most of us have believed if we remain sober for a long stretch, we could thereafter drink normally. But here's a man who had age, who had 55 years, found he was just where he had left off at 30. We have seen the truth demonstrated again and again. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Commencing to drink after a period of sobriety where in a short time as bad as ever. If we are planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation of any kind nor any lurking notion that someday we will be immune to alcohol. Is this man alone? Absolutely not. Our fellowship is loaded with that individual. You know how many people have come in here and heard this statement? You can't stay sober for job, wife, and family? Have you ever heard that? What do they mean? You can't have a long period of sobriety? Staying dry? Uh-uh. They mean when you achieve your goal, then what's going to happen to you? This man had a goal to become successful in business. So he did not drink until he became successful in business. What happened when he achieved his goal? He got drunk. A friend of mine who worked with me when I came into the program was sober 26 years. When I ran a rehab unit in Cleveland, he got drunk 26 years later. 
26 years previous, he came into AA and he, and he said he was going to lose his job. He didn't want to lose his job, he quit drinking. For 26 years I heard from that man or anyone that I worked with. I never read the big book. I never did them steps. I don't do that God business. I just go to meetings and help other people. What happened to him when he retired? He got drunk. He's back in the program about eight years now. And you know what he tells everybody? Your recovery is in a big book in those steps. He's fortunate. He survived. My other friend from Amherst retired from Ford Motor Company after 17 years. 17 years when he retired, he went out drinking. He's not been back, in and out since. All right? And when I first came into AA, I went out. And when I came back, I said, where's Eddie? Well, he wanted to get his girls through college. It took him eight years to get his girls through college. The last one graduated college. He went out drinking. People can stop drinking for ulterior motives in here. And they can use the fellowship to assist them. But you must be careful when you're dealing with those individuals that they don't lead you to believe that you, if you're a real alcoholic, don't need this program. See? You have to be careful what you're listening to in here. And these are some examples for you. Young people may be encouraged by this man's experience to think they can stop as he did on their own willpower. We doubt if many of them can do it because none will really want to stop and hardly one of them, because of the peculiar mental twist already acquired, will find he can win out. Several of our crowd, men of 30 or less, had been drinking only a few years, but they found themselves as helpless as those who had been drinking 20 years. It can happen sooner to some. I've heard some people say, and I believe them, that they were alcoholic from their very first drink. They said from the very first drink, once they started drinking, they lost control. I don't care. I don't care if you're an alcoholic from the very beginning or it took you 25 or 50 years. What's important that you recognize there is a problem. Let's get into the solution. Who cares why you became an alcoholic? Who cares what your mother and father did? Psychiatrist asked me one time, did your mother and father have a normal sex life? I said, they must have, they had me. <laughs> I don't know what their sex life was. <laughs> to be gravely affected, one does not necessarily have to drink a long time nor take the quantities some of us have. This is particularly true of women. Potential female alcoholics often turn into the real thing and are gone beyond recall in a few years. Certain drinkers would be greatly insulted if called alcoholics are astonished at their inability to stop. We are familiar with the symptoms see large numbers of potential alcoholics among young people everywhere, but try and get them to see it. Try and get them to see it. As we look back, we feel we had gone on drinking many years beyond the point where we could quit on our own willpower. If anyone questions whether he has entered this dangerous area, let him try leaving alcohol alone for, for one year. If he is real alcoholic and very far advanced, there is scant chance of success. In the early days of our drinking, we occasionally remain sober for a year or more, becoming serious drinkers again later. But what does that tell me if I have to leave it alone? It tells me I have a problem with it. If I, if I have to leave it alone to control it, that's telling me there's a problem. Though you may be able to stop for a considerable period, you may yet be a potential alcoholic. Underline this. We think few to whom this book will appeal can stay dry anything like a year. Some will be drunk the day after making their resolutions, most of them within a few weeks. For those who are unable to drink moderately, the question is how to stop altogether. Here's the assumption. We are assuming, of course, that the reader desires to stop. We assume everybody in this room today has a desire to quit using and drinking. Whether such a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which he has already lost the power to choose whether he will drink or not. In other words, if some people come in in here 
at an earlier stage of their alcoholism, it tells us that maybe the fellowship may be enough. It's telling us that in black and white. Whether a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis or not is dependent upon how far his alcoholism has gripped him. The farther along the road you go on alcoholism, the more convinced you should be that you need a spiritual way of life. Many of us felt we had plenty of character. There was a tremendous urge to cease forever, yet we found it impossible. This is the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it. This utter inability to leave it alone no matter how great the necessity or the wish. How then shall we help our readers determine to their own satisfaction whether they are one of us? That's a question. How are we going to help you decide whether you're one of us? Here's the question, here's the answer. The experiment of quitting for a period of time will be helpful. But we think we can render an even greater service to alcoholic sufferers and perhaps the medical fraternity. So we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking, for obviously this is the crux of the matter. What's the crux of the matter? The mental states that precede a relapse into drinking is the crux of the matter. What sort of thinking dominates an alcoholic who repeats time after time the desperate experiment of the first drink? That's a question. Friends who have reasoned with him after a spree which has brought him to the point of divorce or bankruptcy are mystified when he walks directly into a saloon. Why does he? That's a question. Of what is he thinking? That's a question. Now we're going to answer these questions that he asked. All your questions are answered in the big book. They mean every question they ask, they answer. Now let's get the answer to those questions. They're going to answer it by a case history of another alcoholic. They're going to tell you the thinking that dominates or precedes the relapse into his drinking again after he has quit. Our first example is a friend we shall call Jim, not John, because John is not a friend. This man has a charming wife and family. He inherited a lucrative automobile agency. That means it makes a lot of money. That's not a type of car. He had a commendable World War record. He was a good salesman. Everybody likes him. He's an intelligent man so far, nor normal so far as we can see, except for a nervous disposition. He did no drinking until he was 35. In a few years, he became so violent when intoxicated, he had to be committed. On leaving the asylum, that's treatment center, he came into contact with us. We told him what we knew of alcoholism and the answer we had found. They're telling him, you know, spiritual recovery. He made a beginning. Underline that, he made a beginning. Here, here was his beginning. His family was reassembled and he began to work as a salesman for the business he had lost through drinking. All went well for a time, but he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. He put the necessary ingredients to get his family back together in a job and he got a few bucks. He stopped. He didn't grow spiritually. To his consternation, he found himself drunk a half dozen times in rapid succession. Now this guy had to be well liked. Because if they're coming back in the old days for the guy six times, he had to be a lot like me. He was well liked. <laughs> On each of these occasions, we worked with him, reviewing carefully what had happened. He agreed he was a real alcoholic and in a serious condition. He knew he faced another trip to the asylum if he kept on. Moreover, he would lose his family for whom he had a deep affection. You see, this guy knows everything. He knows what's going to happen to him if he drinks. I knew what was going to happen to me if I drank again. Did that deter me? Self-knowledge is to no avail. Yet he got drunk again. We asked him to tell us exactly what happened. This is his story. I came to work on Tuesday morning. I remembered I felt irritated. I had to be a salesman for a concern I once owned. I had a few words with the boss, but nothing serious. 
Then I decided to drive into the country and see one of my prospects for a car. What's wrong with the statements as far as we've gone so far? We're going to right, what happened on Monday, right? Okay. Hey? <coughs> exactly. He missed a day on a job and the boss probably said something like this. Hey, we work five days a week here. We don't start on Tuesday, we start on Monday. That's just something that might have happened. But what does the guy not deal with? In his spiritual program, he doesn't like the fact that he lost the agency, he's working for a company he used to own. Resentments is the number one offender. He gets more alcoholics drunk than anything else. All right? He decided to drive into the country and see one of his prospects for a car. That was normal at the time. I don't know, uh, Father Joe knows it and a couple other guys in here, but at one time car salesmen used to come door to door. You didn't go to the lots to buy a car, he'd come to your house. They bring the car, let you drive it two or three days, you checked it out. It's the way it used to be. So there was nothing wrong with this. He went where he figured he'd sell a car. On the way I felt hungry so I stopped at a roadside place where they have a bar. I had no intention of drinking, I just thought I would get a sandwich. I also had the notion I might find a customer for a car at this place, which was familiar for I'd been going to it for years. I had eaten there many times during the months I was sober. I sat down at a table and ordered a sandwich and a glass of milk. Still no thought of drinking. I ordered another sandwich and decided to have another glass of milk. Suddenly, not planned, suddenly, the thought crossed my mind if I were to put an ounce of whiskey in my milk, it couldn't hurt me on a full stomach. I ordered a whiskey and poured it into, it and into the milk. I vaguely sensed I was not being any too smart, but felt reassured as I was taking a whiskey on a full stomach. The experiment went so well that I ordered another whiskey and poured it into more milk. That didn't seem to bother me, so I tried another. Thus started one more journey to the asylum for Jim. That's treatment center. He went back. He relapsed. Here was the threat of commitment, the loss of family, position to say nothing of that intense mental and physical suffering which drinking always caused him. He had much knowledge about himself as an alcoholic, yet reasons for drinking were easily pushed aside in favor of the foolish idea that he could take whiskey if he only mixed it with milk. Sound incredible? That's why alcoholics are hard to understand. That's why we're hard to understand. Look what they say, here's our insanity. Whatever the precise definition of the word may be, we call this plain insanity. Why? Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. It doesn't matter if you drink anything along with your alcohol. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. How can such a lack of proportion of the ability to think straight be called anything else? You may think this an extreme case, to us it is not far-fetched for this kind of thinking has been characteristic of every single one of us. We have sometimes re reflected more than Jim did upon the consequences, but there was always a curious mental phenomenon that parallel with our sound reasoning. There inevitably ran some insanely trivial excuse for taking the first drink. Our sound reasoning failed to hold us in check. The insane idea won out. What's the insane idea? We can drink. When we say the second step came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to, ins to sanity, means to accept the fact that we're alcoholic. It has nothing to do with mental health issues. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. If we think we can drink it again, that's insanity for an alcoholic. Next day we would ask ourselves in all earnestness and sincerity how it could have happened. In some circumstances we've gone out deliberately to get drunk, feeling ourselves justified by what? Nervousness, anger, worry, depression, jealousy, or the like. But even in this type of beginning we are obliged to admit that our justification for a spree was insanely insufficient in the light of what has always happened. We now see that when we began to drink deliberately instead of casually, there was little serious or effective thought during the period of premeditation of what the terrific consequences might be. In other words, when we start thinking about drinking again, 
we're coming right back here to this chart and we're starting to believe on this chart here that we're back over here. We're back with the nine. Anytime a thought of alcohol comes back into your mind again, pull your chart out and look at it and you will see you fit this category. You don't have the enzymes necessary to metabolize alcohol. Once you take a drink physically, you're going to set off the craving for more. You're going to come through, you're going to be filled with uh, guilt, remorse, resentment, self-pity, and fear. And you're going to have to stop again and understand that you're going to have that can't quit obsession with you again. We need a power greater than ourselves. That's what the second step is saying to overcome this problem came to believe that a power greater than ourselves was necessary for us to recover. What are the conditions that can take us back to alcohol? Justify, we mentioned some of them. Nervousness, anger, worry, depression, jealousy, resentment. If these things are, will take us back to drink, we have to find something that will relieve that condition, right? If you hold on to your mark here, we're on page 37, turn to page 87 in your book. And you're going to see how working this program can relieve a lot of conditions. The bottom of page 87. As we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action. We constantly remind ourselves we are no longer running the show humbly saying to ourselves many times each day thy will be done. If you say to yourself many times each day thy will be done, look at the results of that. We are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. We do not tire so easily, for we are not burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. How does it, we get rid of those conditions? The simplicity of the program, a conscious contact with God simply by saying many times each day, thy will be done. Is that difficult? Don't complicate the simplicity of this program. Our behavior is as absurd and incomprehensible with respect to the first drink as that of an individual with a passion, say, for jaywalking. He gets a thrill out of skipping in front of fast-moving vehicles. He enjoys himself for a few years in spite of friendly warnings. In other words, in the beginning, guys are saying, hey, buddy, you better slow down in that traffic. What the heck's wrong with you? You better lay low on your drinking. Don't drink so much. Up to this point, you would label him as a foolish chap having queer ideas of fun. Luck then deserts him and he is slightly injured several times in succession. You would expect him, if he were normal, to cut it out. I would. If that was my son, I'd probably beat him. Presently, he is hit again and this time has a fractured skull. Within a week after leaving the hospital, a fast-moving trolley car breaks his arm. He tells you he has decided to stop jaywalking for good, but in a few weeks he breaks both legs. On through the years, his conduct continues, accompanied by his continual promises to be careful or to keep off the streets altogether. Finally, he can no longer work. His wife gets a divorce, and he's held up to ridicule. He tries every known means to get the jaywalking out of his idea out of his head. He shuts himself up in an asylum, hoping to mend his ways. But the day he comes out, he races in front of a fire engine, which breaks his back. Such a man would be crazy, wouldn't he? You may think our illustration is too ridiculous, but is it? We have been through the ringer, have to admit if we substituted alcoholism for jaywalking, the illustration would fit perfectly, or fit, it would fit exactly. However intelligent we have been in other respects where alcohol has been involved, we have been strangely insane. Strong language, but isn't it true? Yes. The jaywalker, mine was fighting. My mother said, son, when you were a little boy and you were learning to walk, we ran through the house putting cushions on the corners of the woodwork and everything else. So when you fall down, you wouldn't hurt yourself. 
and that protected you and we protected you all through your life now when you grow up and you're a man and you're supposed to be able to think look how you come home every Friday <laughs> you're banged up she couldn't understand it some of you are thinking yes what you tell us is true but it doesn't fully apply we admit we have some of these symptoms but we have not gone to the extremes you fellows did nor are we likely to for we understand ourselves so well after what you have told us that such things cannot happen again here comes self-knowledge again right we have not lost everything in life through drinking and we certainly do not intend to thanks for the information that may be true of certain non-alcoholic people who though drinking foolishly and heavenly at the present time are able to stop or moderate because of their brains and bodies have not been damaged as ours were. Underline this. But the actual or potential alcoholic with hardly an exception will be absolutely unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. This is a point we wish to emphasize and re-emphasize to smash home upon our alcoholic readers it has been revealed to us out of bitter experience let us take another illustration we're going again to the psychic change that's necessary information and education does not seem to do it what did Carl Jung the world's most renowned psychiatrist say to Roland Hazard yes there is hope for you you can recover through a what vital spiritual experience why do we go through the first 11 steps of AA? So we can get to the experience which relieves us of our condition. We don't go through the first 11 steps to eliminate alcohol or drugs. We go through the first 11 to bring a power greater than ourselves into our lives. Fred is the partner in a well-known accounting firm. His income is good, he has a fine home, is happily married and a father of promising children of college age. He has so attractive a personality he makes friends with everyone. There I am again. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late in the afternoon, right? <laughs> if ever there was a successful businessman, it is Fred. To all appearances, he is a stable, well-balanced individual, yet he is alcoholic. We first saw Fred about a year ago in the hospital where he had gone to recover from a bad case of jitters. It was his first experience of this kind and he was much ashamed of it. You hear what we just read? He was much ashamed of it. He's in a hospital for it. Alcoholism is still shame-based. And that's why most people get her through courts or employers. Alcoholics who have the disease and are not ordered into this treatment it's still considered a shame-based disease. I can tell you story after story when I work with the court system of how many influential citizens in our community were planted for no other reason than they had alcoholism and the family was too ashamed for them to admit it. They made all kinds of, oh, he had, he had this problem in his life or she had this or this happened in her life. I said, no, he's alcoholic, he can't drink. <gasps> I made arrangements to put people in the hospital, one particular, very influential family. The son called me back and said, we're not ready to take such drastic measures yet. You know what the drastic measures were? Put them in a detox unit. Ten days later, they buried him. He drank himself to death. They would rather have him dead than in an alcoholism ward. Don't believe we're making progress. How did most of you get here? Probably through the courts or an employer. Most of us. Far from admitting he was an alcoholic, he told himself he came to the hospital to rest his nerves. He's lying about it. He's not honest about his alcoholism. The doctor intimated strongly he might be worse than he realized. For a few days he was depressed about his condition. He made up his mind to quit drinking altogether. It never occurred to him that perhaps he could not do so in spite of his character and standing. Fred would not believe himself an alcoholic, much less accept their spiritual remedy for his problem. We told him what we knew about alcoholism. He was interested, 
and conceded that he had some of the symptoms, but he was a long way from admitting he could do nothing about it himself. He was positive that this humiliating experience plus the knowledge he had acquired would keep him sober the rest of his life. Again, self-knowledge would fix it. Knowing is not enough. We heard no more for Fred from more of Fred for a while. One day we were told he was back in the hospital. This time he was quite shaky. He soon indicated he was anxious to see us. The story he told is most instructive for here was a chap absolutely convinced he had to stop drinking, who had no excuse for drinking, who exhibited splendid judgment and determination and all his other concerns yet was flat back on his back nevertheless. Let him tell you about it. And here's what Fred says. I was much impressed with what you fellas said about alcoholism and I frankly did not believe it would be possible for me to drink again. I rather appreciated your ideas about the subtle insanity which precedes the first drink, but I was confident it could not happen to me after what I had learned. I reasoned I was not so far advanced as most of you fellas, that I had been usually successful in licking my other personal problems, and that I would therefore be successful where you men failed. I felt I had every right to be self-confident that would be only a matter of exercising my willpower and keeping on guard. In this frame of mind, I went about my business, and for a time all was well. You know why? He wasn't drinking. He could function. I had no trouble refusing drinks and began to wonder if I had not been making too hard work out of a simple matter. One day I went to Washington to present some accounting evidence to a government bureau. I had been out of town before during this particular dry spell, so there was nothing new about that. Physically, I felt fine. Neither did I have any pressing problems or worries. My business came off well. I was pleased and knew my partners would be too. It was the end of a perfect day, not a cloud on the horizon. This guy has got no pressures on him. Everything's fallen in place for him. Why? He's not drinking alcohol. And we have found this, this is what they're saying in a book previously. We build up the confidence of those people around us. We quit drinking for a period of time. They all put their hope back into us again. What happens? A senseless series of sprees and we're off again. Look what happens to this guy. I went to my hotel and leisurely dressed for dinner. Leisurely means like my wife does. You know how long it takes her when you're sitting going someplace? That's leisurely getting dressed. You know, I I told her one day, I said, Carol, you have to throw your clock away and put a calendar on a wall. <laughs> As I crossed the threshold of the dining room, the thought came to mind it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner. That was all, nothing more. The man did not plan his drunk. That's spontaneous. That's why he's writing it again in that nervous handwriting of his. The man walked across the threshold and an idea came to his mind. And when you, that idea turns into obsession, what happens? Goodbye. I ordered a cocktail in my meal. Then I ordered another cocktail. After dinner, I decided to take a walk. And when he's taking that walk, he's probably thinking to himself, I had two drinks, no more. I got this thing licked. When I returned to the hotel, it struck me a highball would be fine before going to bed. So I stepped into the bar and had one. I remembered having several more that night and plenty next morning. I have a shadowy recollection of being in an airplane bound for New York and of finding a friendly taxi cab driver at the landing field instead of my wife. The driver escorted me about for several days. I know little of where I went or what I said and did. Then came to hospital with unbearable mental and physical suffering. What happened to that man again? What happened to him after he took a drink? The same thing we saw on the chart so many times. When a man physically cannot metabolize alcohol and is left with the mental obsession, then he's powerless. 
This guy took a drink of alcohol, he went right back through the process again. All right? Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. We have to understand that abstinence takes care of this. But the program gets rid of these uh, can't quit obsession ideas. Those ideas don't come into your mind when you have a spiritual experience or awakening. If they do, you're able to slough them off. But if you don't treat your alcoholism, ideas like this are going to become sensible to you because you'll have no higher power in your life. As soon as I regained my ability to think, I went carefully over that evening in Washington. Not only had I been off guard, I had made no fight whatever against the first drink. This time I had not thought of the consequences at all. The mental obsession. I had commenced to drink as carelessly as though the cocktails were ginger ale. I now remembered what my alcoholic friends had told me, how they prophesied that if I had an alcoholic mind, the time and place would come, I would drink again. They had said that though I did raise a defense, it would one day give way before some trivial reason for having a drink. Well, just that did happen and more. For what I had learned of alcoholism did not occur to me at all. I knew from that moment I had an alcoholic mind. I saw that willpower and self-knowledge would not help in those strange mental blank spots. I had never been able to understand people who said a problem had them hopelessly defeated. I knew then it was a crushing blow. All right? Some people say, well, you know, I quit smoking cigarettes on my own. I didn't have any help. I can do the same thing with alcohol. Well, go ahead and try. I don't argue with anybody. If you try and it works, glad. I'll never see you again. I'm happy for you. But if you try and it doesn't work, come back and see us. If you have tried your own programs for whatever addiction you're here for, and you find you're using again, don't consider yourself a loser. Just say, I have proven to myself, just like these guys, that maybe AA makes sense after all. It's your life. It's your gift. If you want it. Two of the members of Alcoholics Anonymous came to see me. They grinned, which I didn't like so much, and then asked me if I thought myself alcoholic and if I were really licked this time. I had to concede both propositions. They piled on me heaps of evidence to the effect that an alcoholic mentality such as I had exhibited in Washington was a hopeless condition. They cited cases out of their own experience by the dozen. This process snuffed out the last flicker of conviction I could do the job myself. Then they outlined the spiritual answer and program of action which a hundred of them had followed successfully. Though I had been only a nominal churchman, their proposals were not intellectually hard to swallow. But the program of action, though entirely sensible, was pretty drastic. It meant I would have to throw several lifelong conceptions out the window. That was not easy. But the moment I made up my mind to go through with the process, I had the curious feeling that my alcoholic condition was relieved as in fact it proved to be. And what this man did is he made a decision to turn his will and life over the care of God as we understood them. You're going to find out that tomorrow when we get into the book and into the steps, when we do this step together, and you, you know, you don't have to do it if, if you don't want to, but we find out going through the process, some of us have already done that, some of us haven't. Nobody knows who did and who didn't. But you will find out after we go through this third step that feeling's going to start vibrating in this room. And you will also see the directions tell you you go on with the program. It doesn't say a year later. It says immediately. And when you start getting into the steps and see the directions that are laid out for you, you're going to find out how much you've been missing if you haven't gotten this into your life yet. And that's what this man found out. Quite as important was the discovery that spiritual principles would solve all my problems. I have since been brought into a way of living infinitely more satisfying and I hope more useful than the life I lived before. 
My old manner of life was by no means a bad one. I would not exchange its best moments for the worst I have now. I would not go back to it even if I could. What statement did we just make? When a man stands up and he leads and he says, I wouldn't give my best day, my worst day sober for my best day drinking. Got that right out of the big book. That's just what we covered there. Fred's story speaks for itself. We hope it strikes home to thousands like him. He had only felt the first uh, nip of the ringer. Most alcoholics have to be pretty badly mangled before they really commence to solve their problems. Many doctors and psychiatrists agree with our conclusions. One of these men, staff member of a world-renowned hospital, recently made this statement to some of us. What you say about the general hopelessness of the average alcoholic's plight is, in my opinion, correct. As to two of you men whose stories I have heard, there is no doubt in my mind that you were 100% hopeless apart from divine help. Had you offered yourself as patients to this hospital, I would not have taken you if I had been able to avoid it. People like you are too heartbreaking. Though not a religious person, I have profound respect for the spiritual approach in such cases as yours. For most cases, there is virtually no other solution. Once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink, except in a few rare cases, neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. His defense must come from a higher power. Now, that's strong language. But when people were accepting the fact that what they were presenting in this program was of essential necessity for us to recover, they were showing about a 75% recovery rate. It's when we have gotten away from the spiritual message and we have sold people the idea that all you have to do is come and sit down in a chair and keep it warm seven nights a week, 365 days a year, and some kind of magic is going to occur is where we have come into the confusion. We have so insisted that meetings are the answer to our problems that pro nobody gets into the program of action. Alcoholics Anonymous and its 12 steps are a treatment for alcoholism. The fellowship is a support group. The steps treat my alcoholism. Why do we consider this a spiritual program? Because from the very beginning, the idea came from a, from a psychiatrist who said a spiritual experience is necessary. Therefore, we designed a process that is spiritual in nature for us to have a spiritual occurrence in our life, a spiritual experience or awakening. That's what the whole program is all about. That relieves us of this mental condition to go back. It's not, it's not difficult. Don't make it that way. But don't ever leave any of these sessions and say, Finley said all I gotta do is read the big book. Some people have done that. He says, I don't have to go to meetings. I go to as many meetings as anybody in this room. But I also work the steps every day of my life. Because you see, Another piece of misinformation is you do the first nine one time. You're going to find that's misinformation. You work the 12 steps every day of your life. There's no such thing as three maintenance steps. I don't know where that baloney got started. Let's stay with the black print. All right?